Hello Penguinauts, I'm the Bitty Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Endurance. Last episode we launched the Prometheus, a mission to capture and redirect a Class C asteroid which is threatening solitude. After a little bit of ballet trying to get the claw to actually grab the goddamn asteroid, we do actually finally manage to get a grip on it. And so, all we have to do now is the very small task of actually getting it into orbit of Guardian so that we can get our huge payout. We do actually rename it Brissinger because I, I kind of thought, you know, Prometheus stole fire from the gods. Brissinger is the word for fire in the ancient language in Aragon, which is a great fantasy series and I'm a massive nerd. Moving on, we do actually try and reorient the spacecraft around the claw so that we can actually fire the engine through the center of mass of the asteroid. However, for some reason, that's not working. I disengaged the free pivot, but for some reason, the pivot's still locked. So, we're kind of stuck not firing the engine through the center of mass of the asteroid. Thankfully, though, we managed to grab it in a place where we're pretty close to the center of mass. So, as long as we still have some mass, yes, we should be fine. You've probably noticed, though, uh, for some reason, time warping while grabbing an asteroid causes you to start to clip into the asteroid. So... The front of the spacecraft is now embedded halfway inside Brissinger, which is a little strange. I don't know why asteroids are so glitchy. I had loads of problems with them in this episode, with them just randomly exploding and my game crashing. It's not a mod conflict at all, because this spacecraft has entirely stock parts on it. Um, struggling to grab the asteroid and yeah. I don't know what it is about asteroids that make them so glitchy. But anyway, as you've probably noticed, uh, it's at this point I realise, ah, we're actually in a retrograde orbit around the planet. So it's going to be a little bit awkward for spacecraft to actually launch to us. And we should have really altered that while the asteroid was still heading in right on the edge of the solar system. Well, no, edge of the sphere of influence of solitude, not the edge of the solar system. That would take uh, quite a bit of redirecting in advance. But yeah, um, unfortunately we have to do a rather inefficient burn to entirely reverse our orbit. Thankfully I noticed before you reduced our apoapsis height too much, but that uses quite a bit of fuel, so we're not going to have enough fuel now to bring our apoapsis down and also change the inclination of our orbit. I did want to change the inclination of the orbit as far out from the planet as possible, but we're not going to have enough fuel to do both. So. What we're going to have to do uh, is we're going to have to bring down our apoapsis as much as we can and then we're going to have to launch a second mission up to the asteroid to refuel the first one and then actually give ourselves enough fuel uh, to change that inclination and then get us into orbit around Guardian. So yeah, I completely underestimated just how much Delta V would actually need to redirect this asteroid because, I mean, it weighs 150 tons and I kind of forgotten how the different classes of asteroid worked. So, you know, you'll have to forgive me for that. But hey, Prometheus 2 is uh, much, much better equipped to actually redirect an asteroid considering it actually has some drills on board. So, I don't know why I didn't put these on the original mission, but what we can do is we can drill ore out of the asteroid, both making the asteroid lighter and also allowing us to then convert that ore into liquid fuel and oxidize it, giving us more delta V. So, you know, everybody wins. So, once we send this up there, we're going to have more than enough delta V to change the inclination and get that asteroid out to Guardian. But first, we have to actually, you know, rendezvous with it, and with, <laughs> with the extremely eccentric orbit that it's actually in, that's a little easier said than done. The fact that Solitude is tidally locked really does make this sort of thing quite awkward. Unless the actual uh, longitude of your ascending node is really lined up with the launch site, you're kind of stuffed because the planet doesn't orbit um, or doesn't rotate underneath the orbit. So you can't launch when the launch site is directly underneath the orbit. Um, you have to launch from where the uh, space center is and it's not going to move from there as I said it's tidally locked to Archangel so a little bit awkward so we're gonna have to do quite a hefty inclination change here to actually get ourselves in the same plane as Brissinger uh, but once we do that we should be fine to rendezvous. Uh, we actually had a little bit of a problem because Prometheus 1 doesn't have any kind of habitation on board and as such Ted he's actually going to refuse to work soon he's going to go stir crazy and thanks to USI colonization he's not going to work anymore so that's another reason we had to send another spacecraft we wouldn't have actually had enough time to get Brissinger out to Guardian um, to actually um, to actually do that and get it into orbit uh, we probably could have waited 
actually, if we did have a lot more time. Um, just until the orbit lined up with Guardian, we might have been able to get ourselves an encounter, even with the crazy inclination that uh, the asteroid is actually at. But uh, as I said, we didn't uh, have the time to wait around for that. But you can see Prometheus 2 in all of its glory now. A hell of a lot of radiators because those surface drills, they produce a lot of heat. And for them to operate at their maximum efficiency, you need to have them at the perfect temperature. So we've got a lot of radiators so we can manage that heat. And as you can see, we've got some observation cupolas, or is it cupola? I have no idea. Uh, so that our little Kerbonauts, Katrina and Ted, can actually stay uh, on board Prometheus and around Brissinger for quite some time. We have actually nailed landing these 3.75 uh, metre launch stages now. So we just have to leave the bottom tank completely full of fuel and then fire three engines and that slows us down just enough that uh, we aren't going to burn up on re-entry. So we do land on a hill but thankfully we have enough parachutes that even though it does topple over, it topples over so slowly that it does actually touch down rather gently. Getting a beautiful view of the Aurora there as we rocket out into the heavens to rendezvous with Prometheus 1 and Brissinger, of course. Heaving around a 150 ton asteroid really is quite a lot of work. I probably should have just sent this spacecraft up first, but hey, you know, it's a bit of an adventure. I do have a lot of people sort of citing episodes like this one where I have to launch rescue missions all the time because I completely miscalculated Delta V. Like, ah, you should get... Kerbal Engineer beard. Yeah, I see. As, as if it's a, like, and I told you so. But it's this sort of thing which is the reason why I refuse to get Kerbal Engineer. If you have an exact Delta V readout before you launch every mission, it's just not really much fun. <laughs> it's quite a lot of fun to launch rescue missions and the like. Um, I quite enjoy screwing up and then having to actually cope with it. If you do everything perfectly, it's a little bit dull for me. That's just how I like to play Kerbal Space Program. You know, that's just me. That's just my personal preference. But I've been playing this game for a long, long time. So, yeah, I do kind of need to play it the way that I most enjoy it. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be able to find enough will to actually continue playing it. But I do really enjoy recording Endurance. And uh, to a certain extent, I enjoy recording Kerbal Rising as well. So, you know, I'm certainly not burning out anytime soon. We do get a lovely view of the Aurora Australis there. Would it still be the Australis if it's on a different planet? The Southern Lights, anyway. <laughs> as we're approaching the asteroid here. Uh, we do have, again, some troubles actually grabbing the asteroid, which is a little bit irritating. I don't know why these claws are so glitchy when it comes to actually grabbing the surface of an asteroid. Um, but there we go, it's alright. We don't bounce off much. And we just deploy those drills and we get them harvesting the surface of the asteroid. Significantly reducing the actual mass of it as well. It's quite interesting that some small drills put into one side of the asteroid can mine ore from the entire thing and reduce it from 150 tons to something like 30 tons. Uh, I don't know how we're processing that much raw ore with a tiny little refinery out here at Dirty Ones to Pure Fuel, but hey, I'm not complaining. Um, it produces quite a lot of fuel, pretty much entirely filling all of the tanks on Prometheus 2 and most of the tanks on Prometheus 1. So we have plenty of Delta V now. However, once again, we do kind of have that problem where for some reason the claw isn't allowing us to free pivot around it, which is very, very irritating. So we're not again, going to be able to just fire the engine um, straight through the center of mass. Normally, as I said, you can pivot the spacecraft, so you're firing through the center of mass of the asteroid, and that means that the asteroid isn't going to turn as you're actually firing. But uh, thankfully, once again, we are close to the center of mass. So with our RCS, and I did bring a lot of RCS uh, tanks on both of these spacecraft, which I both filled up uh, when I processed that ore, uh, so we should be absolutely fine. We can just about maintain our attitude as we perform our very hefty inclination change burn so that we can get ourselves into the same plane as Guardian and then we can get ourselves off into orbit. Ah, uh, isn't it wonderful? I'm just gonna have a drink. Excuse me, the weather is very, very nice at the moment. It's lovely. It's, I don't think it's rained for quite a few weeks now, which is very nice. Now that my exams are finished, I can actually enjoy it. Um, although, obviously, I don't cope that well with hot weather because I'm a British person. I do remember the last time I talked about hot weather. I think it was on this series, actually. I spoke about... Um, no, I think it... Yeah, no, it was Fall of Kerbin, actually. And I sp <laughs> spoke about it being 35 degrees. I have all these Americans in the comments section, like, 
35 degrees, Beardy? Whoa, what a wimp. Why are you complaining about that? Not obviously realizing that I'm British and here we use Celsius. <laughs> They're like, here in America it reaches well over 100 degrees. I'm like, I'm using Celsius, not, not Fahrenheit. You, you would think that if you're complaining about it being absolutely roasting hot you it's 35 degrees fahrenheit i think that's almost freezing isn't it yeah um i'm not quite that much of a wind but like us british people you know we, we're not that good with hot weather but we're not quite that bad although we are certainly close but anyway we finally get ourselves our encounter with guardian and this time we actually adjust the orbit uh, right on the edge of the sphere of influence. So we get ourselves into a prograde orbit. And then we're going to adjust that down to about 50 kilometers and a nice circular orbit. Uh, we're actually going to keep Ted and Katrina up here for quite some time. Um, because we're going to have to retrieve the crew of Talos 1 in about 100 days or so. So there's very little point sending another spacecraft up to go retrieve them. We'll just retrieve them when we retrieve the crew of Talos 1. Because uh, in about 100 days or so, we're going to be launching our mission to Demand is just going to be pretty freaking awesome so i'm going to wait until um well we're going to run out of life support on talos one and everything by then but we're going to retrieve the crew from hyperion retrieve the crew from talos one and then once they're back and they're rested uh, then we're going to build the interplanetary spacecraft to demise and we're going to have our interplanetary mission unfortunately we do actually run out of fuel in Prometheus 2, so I want to fire the engine on Prometheus 1, but after draining most of the ore out of the asteroid, Prometheus 1 is now way too far from the center of mass, so we have to reorient it. Unfortunately, as I said, we have that glitch where it's clipped into the asteroid, so when we disengage the claw from Brissinger, we get shot out about five kilometers, uh, <laughs> which is a little bit irritating, uh, but thankfully nothing is damaged, so all we then have to do is head back to the asteroid and then just grab it again um, a little bit closer to the center of mass. As you see, we target the center of mass and yeah, we're pretty close to it. So we still have a bit of RCS left. We should be able to finish our insertion burn to get ourselves into orbit of Guardian and get that glorious payout of something like 350,000 funds plus the advance payment as well. So we are stockpiling quite a lot of funds. I think we, at the end of this mission, have about two and a half million funds. Um, and we're going to need to research a lot of parts before we do that interplanetary mission and stuff. So we're certainly going to be spending that, that's for sure. Uh, but we have upgraded most of our facilities now. So uh, besides that interplanetary mission, we don't have a huge amount of expenditure. And once we've launched that interplanetary mission as well, uh, we're going to be set because with all of our current strategies, like to boldly go and everything, giving us loads of money and stuff when we research, uh, well, return science from new celestial bodies and the like, we're going to get a lot of money from an interplanetary mission to devise and back, trust me. So, uh, yeah, that should have a pretty extensive payout, um, which is certainly going to be quite important because, I mean, warp drives, yeah, they ain't cheap. Some of the later interstellar tech is really expensive, like 2.5 million funds just to research it. So, uh, yeah, we're going to need to start stockpiling now. But anyway, we finally have Brissinger in a low orbit of Guardian. We do grab ourselves a sample, which doesn't actually give us that much science, surprisingly, for the amount of effort it took. But uh, there we go. We have finally got Brissinger in a nice stable orbit, and we'll take Ted and Katrina home at some point in the future. However, while we were doing that mission, our Sentinel Space Telescope, which is mapping near solitude asteroids, has actually finished its contract and we get another one to map even more asteroids but it is going to require us to move it into a slightly different orbit but since we're in a solar orbit it's going to take quite some time to actually adjust ourselves into that different orbit so uh, we set ourselves a maneuver node and then we launch our next mission so we actually have a transfer window to reaper Beardy, what planet's Reaper? Well, Reaper used to be Jewel. However, as Archangel has expanded, the outer layers of the atmosphere of Jewel have very slowly been destroyed and it's basically eroded away by the solar wind. A very similar thing to what happened to Mars, although Jewel does actually have magnetic fields. So why exactly that happens so fast, I don't really know, but don't think about it too much. Anyway, so with the outer atmosphere actually being stripped away, a surface has actually been revealed. Yes, Jewel is actually... I don't want to say a super Earth, a super Kerbin, okay? It's a massive rocky planet just with a very, very thick atmosphere, which is now actually thin enough to land something on. 
So, this is actually quite a big mission. We don't even have a contract, but uh, we should get enough money just from world firsts and the like to more than pay for this. So, this is the Echo 1 space probe, and it actually has two separate parts. It has an orbiter, which is going to visit Reaper and all of its moons, which will have changed a great deal since Archangel started expanding as well. And that big bit at the top where you don't see it any <laughs> you're not seeing it right now because we're just landing the first stage once again saving ourselves a hell of a lot of money with those very expensive vector engines um but that big bulge at the top of the spacecraft is actually a rover because the surface gravity of reaper is two and a half g's and it has an atmosphere i believe it's five atmospheres thick uh, an atmospheric height of ninety thousand meters so we're certainly never ever going to be sending a manned mission to the surface of reaper i'm not sure if it's it would certainly be possible but it would be such an undertaking to have a return mission there and back but because of that we're sending a rover I'm actually pretty proud of it. With the Tarsier Space Technologies mod, uh, we actually have a lot of really nice rover parts, uh, especially the Curiosity camera. So it's going to be pretty sweet, and it's sort of compact and folded up. It's got all these folding antennas and stuff. I'm really happy with it, but you can't actually see it right now. It is enclosed uh, in a very well a sealed atmospheric entry vehicle with a big 2.5 meter heat shield, a sky crane, and a hell of a lot of parachutes to slow it down because it's going to be quite a rough descent down to the surface. Surface. And then while that's exploring the surface uh, with its short range antenna, the orbiter for a short time at least is going to act as a relay back to solitude and then it's going to explore all the different moons. Getting off quite a wonderful bounty of science while it is there and it is powered by three nuclear engines so this wasn't exactly a cheap mission but uh with us using reusable rockets and of course with uh, massive scale launches giving us some money just for launching a large spacecraft uh, it's only about 200,000 funds of investment so uh, in about two years when it arrives at reaper we should get quite a large payout for that however as I said, we have a demise interplanetary mission coming up, so what we need to do, I'm just cutting out the launch here because you've, <laughs> you've seen this rocket uh, launch a million times. I have actually named it now. The big 3.75 meter one is called the Eagle, and the one that we have launched here with two side boosters, this is called the Buzzard. Just naming them after birds that aren't the Falcon. <laughs> People always name rockets after Falcons in KSP, even before, you know, SpaceX became famous. I'm just trying to think of other birds that, uh, well, other birds of prey that might be fitting. But uh, we are sending a mission out to Nemesis because the Hyperion surface base has A, run out of things to research, so it's not actually producing us any science anymore, and they're all running out of life support as well. So we're just going to send a mission out to go take them home. We could top them up with life support, but as I said, they've run out of things to research on the surface, um, and really we're going to need them for the upcoming missions, so it's there's not really much point. We're just going to send a mission to bring them home. Um, and with all our new reusable rockets and everything, and with massive scale launches and everything, even though we're not completing a single contract doing this, it really doesn't cost us much to actually retrieve them. I think in the end it only costs us about 30,000 funds to actually do this mission because we did it really quite frugally. Uh, we actually get a little bit of science from it as well because uh, our insertion burn here to get ourselves into orbit of Nemesis, actually, um, it lines up really, really well. I mean, completely intentionally, of course, but it lines up really well with the base, so we don't even need to orbit round once, and we can just head straight down to the surface, which means that this sort of transfer stage that we're using can crash into the surface. And if you all remember correctly, we set up all of our uh, seismic instruments on the base so that they record impacts, and then we can get some data about the surface and, well, I guess the subterranean composition of Nemesis. So we get quite a bit of science once this um, transfer stage here is burnt out, then we just let it crash down towards the surface and we can get ourselves quite another uh, wonderful bounty of science. I'm saying that quite a lot. Bounty of science. I can't really think of another word. I, I've, it has been pointed out to me multiple times that <laughs> whenever I make a video, especially post commentary, I always have like a word of the day. Um, which I just say 50 times. Maybe today bounty is just because I really like bounties. I'm the kind of person that, um, what I do is I don't eat the bounties in the box of celebrations. I eat all the other ones as well because everyone else eats them. But then everyone else leaves the bounties. So I eat all the other stuff as well. And then it's just bounties left. And then I'm the only person who likes the bounties. So then I just get all the bounties too. So I get as much chocolate as everyone else plus all the bounties. It's probably... 
yeah, it's probably not <laughs> the nicest thing to do, but hey, you know, you've got to have tactics to get the maximum uh, amount of sweets out of the celebrations box, you know? These are these are primary school tactics, all right? Okay, I developed these from a young age. I think maybe there was something wrong with me. <laughs> bit, of a, bit of a sociopath, but hey. So we just pick up our four crew members off of the base of Hyperion. We get a lovely shot of uh, Archangel there, just uh, with Solitude silhouetted against it. Much, much larger, of course, and, you know, we're not getting perfect solar eclipses anymore because, of course, you know, Archangel is so massive these days. Uh, we did actually break one of the solar panels in transferring the crew over because I wasn't particularly careful with it. I just sent them over at about 30 meters per second on their uh, EVA packs. But we get ourselves back on a course to the surface of Solitude, re-enter, and we bring our Kerbonauts home. So in the next episode, we will, of course, be bringing home the crew of Talos 1. We will also be sending a probe, obviously a much smaller and cheaper probe mission, out to Eltos, the new name for Elu. And we'll begin building our planetary spacecraft to demise. But that has been the end of the episode. Thank you very much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you all next time.